who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leads us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my That you would bear my cross You lay down your life Then I would be set free Whoa, Jesus I sing for All that you've done for me Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The key of glory, the key of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The key of glory, the king above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. Then I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Whoa, Jesus I sing for All that you've done for me Your love so great, Jesus in all things. I've seen a glimpse of your heart a billion years. Still I'll be singing. How can I praise you enough? How can I praise you enough? You are the Lord Almighty, outshining all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean, oh, nothing else compares. 
creation calls all to the Savior. We are alive for your praise in earth and sky. No one is higher. Our God of wonders, you reign. Our God of wonders, you reign. You are the Lord Almighty, outshining all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else compares. You are the Lord Almighty, outshining all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else compares. Not to us, but to your name, we lift up all praise not to us but to your name we lift up all praise not to us but to your name we lift up all praise not to us but to your name we lift up stars in glory your love is like the wildest ocean oh nothing else compares you are the lord almighty outshining all the stars in glory your love is like the wildest ocean compares not to us but to your name we lift up all praise not to us but to your name we lift up all praise not to us but to your name we lift up all praise not to us but to your name we lift up all praise you are the lord almighty outshining all the stars in glory your love is like the wildest ocean oh nothing else compares you are the lord almighty outshining all the stars in glory your love is like the wildest ocean oh nothing else compares Our last song today, O Come to the Altar. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide for Was born with the precious. 
As you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasures you found Thank you guys for coming. It's good to see all of you today. Please greet one another and you may be seated.
walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we had had from had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love that we walk according to his commandment. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one, such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves, so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked work. Though I have much to cry to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face, so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister, greet Please bow your head. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for this day. And Father, we thank you for this gathering of people. And Father, we're just so blessed to be able to come here and worship you today on your day. Father, we pray for those that are sick or confirmed or could be injured or whatever in our congregation and just throughout. And Father, we pray that you could give them blessing, grace, healing, and just your love that they may know that you are always with them. Father, we want to pray for those that you have marked out that might not be in Christ this morning, Father, that you would let the Holy Spirit blow through them like it did the apostles, and that they may know that they have been touched, and Father, that they would run to Christ and know, know that great love. And Father, we just want to thank you for everything you have given us. And Father, be with Pastor Rick today as he brings the message and let the Holy Spirit be with him as he cannot do it on, on his own because it is just such too big of a task. And Father, we ask all this and pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Inside the bulletin is uh, an insert about vacation Bibles. Of course, it's next week, July 12th through the 16th, from 7 to 9 Eastern Time uh, next week. So, if you know any children that might like to come or could help or whatever, please just keep that in your mind and please uh, be praying for it. Just continue to pray for you. 
There will be a business meeting following the 11 o'clock service. Of course, vacation Bible school begins this week, July 12th through the 16th, from 7 to 9 30 each evening. Be sure to come and invite your friends and family to come with you. Commencement will be Sunday, July 18th at 10 during Sunday school hours, and a potluck picnic will follow the 11 o'clock service. There will be a Whetstone Men's Ministry Sunday morning, July 17th at 7. During the month of July, we will be collecting clothing for girls and boys, underwear, socks, and t-shirts and pants for Operation Christmas Child. The food pantry is in need of the following items. Crackers, spaghetti, grits, rice, powdered milk, gravy, Mixed canned meats, carrots, mixed vegetables, canned fruit, canned soup, peanut butter, spaghetti sauce, personalized and dried, and bar soap. Donations appreciated for many who have a surplus of fresh garden vegetables or eggs. All donations are greatly appreciated. Uh, our birthday, happy birthday to Loretta French, July 13th. Lily Casey, July 13th. Valerie Lucas, July 14th. Raven Hartwell, July 15th. Pat Cronus, July 16th. And Donna H. French, July 17th. And happy anniversary to Jesse and Nicole Whitfield, July 14th. Three years. Congratulations. And God has defended you in battle. You get me to know it. And our new city catechism question, what hope does everlasting life owe for us? It reminds us that this present fallen world is not all there is. Soon we will have and enjoy God forever in the new city and in the new heaven and, and the new earth. There will be fully and forever free from all sin, and will inhabit renewed resurrection bodies and a renewed, restored creation. Now, did I miss anything? to come for children's talk. Come on, Dad. <laughs> good morning. How are you all? Good? Good. You having a good week? Well, I'm going to try to build something this morning, Trisha, and I'm going to need your help. I'm going to try to build a house. I'm going to start with this little block, okay? And I'm going to build my house in this little block. You think I can build a big house in this little block? I'm going to try. This is my bottom. This is going to be the whole base. This whole big house is going to sit on. You think it's going to be big enough? You think it's going to be big enough for this whole big old house? little base to hold this big house up. It's getting kind of wobbly. What do you think? Hmm? Is that going to be big enough? It's not, is it? What if I took this big base and I started working on this big, building my house on this big base and start here? That's big enough to hold his house up then, isn't it? That's how God wants us to start our life, is to firm foundation. And that's what we're going to be talking about this week in Bible school. I've got some things listed here that we're going to be talking about this week. We're going to be 
talking about building our firm foundations, our foundations of love, and our foundations of forgiveness, our foundations of worth, our foundations of promise, and our foundations of life. And they all start if we have a firm foundation in Christ, and Christ will hold us up and help hold us up as we go through all of our trials and tribulations and all of our problems in life. God's going to help us hold us up if we start with our firm foundation in Him. And it talks about it in the Bible. In the Bible, our Bible verse for this week, too, is Philippians 1, 6. It says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So we just got to start out with a firm foundation in Christ. Say a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this beautiful day. Lord, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, thank you for all your good gifts. Keep us safe. Our souls are our sins. Amen. morning. Let me ask you first to turn your Bibles to Matthew 27. <clears throat> We're going to look at just a very few verses. Matthew 27, 11 through 14 here in just a moment. But before we get there, I would like to take a look at that New City Catechism. We're on question 52. And the question that's, that's posed here is, what hope does everlasting life hold for us? And the answer that is provided is it reminds us that this present fallen world is not all there is. Soon we'll be, we will live with and enjoy God forever in the new city, in the new heaven, and the new earth, where we will be fully and forever freed from all sin and will we'll inhabit renewed, resurrection bodies and a renewed restored creation what that means is, is all the imperfections that this life has that you and I accept on a regular basis in other words all those aches and woes those pains those things in your body that seem to be going in the wrong direction um, all of those will subside but more more significantly than that is there will be no sin Sin will be altogether removed from the newly created order. Uh, you were born into a world that is in an estate of fallenness. And that's the only thing you've ever understood. So it's outside of our experience to know what this is going to look like. But the promise of the, of the word of God is, is that where you are headed to, the eternity for all the redeemed of God, that is Christians, the eternity that they inherit that is theirs because of what Christ purchases for them, is one of absolute perfection. I might try to think about perfection, but I do a rather poor job of even trying to imagine it. I have a pretty good imagination, and yet it's, it's too small and too poor to, to truly picture what perfection looks like. What it would be like to, in any moment of my life, have no idea of anything that I am in lack of. We can't do that. Even on our best day, we, it could have been a little better right? I, even on a great day. I've heard people say it couldn't have been any better. You give them 10 minutes, all of a sudden, but, right? In eternity, it'll actually be that. The, the eternity that you and I will inherit because of our faith in Christ, because of the payment made by Christ, is one of absolute perfection. It, it, and that perfection is foreign to us. It's a, it's, it's a natural because it's altogether supernatural. Now, creation was wonderful when God made it. He said so at the beginning and said it was good. And in that good, it doesn't just mean good like when somebody says, well, how was that, whatever you made to eat or whatever it was you fixed for them? It was good. What do you mean by that is I got it down, <laughs> right? 
That's not what God's good meant. It was without flaw, but then sin entered in. And you and I have lived in an environment of uh, fallenness since then. The, the promise of God, and as we, we heard from Miss Peggy, she read a text that will be used this week in our VBS. And please be desperately praying for that. Um, the work that God begins, he never, he never lets off. He is faithful to complete that work. That work he's begun in you by means of your faith in Christ will in fact be completed. And it will be completed in an eternity of absolute joyful perfection. Now I'm, uh, I'm going to ask Matthew to put up the statement of Christology and we're going to take a look at that. Because I find that particularly helpful today. Because when we look at Matthew 27, Jesus is confronted with the person of Pilate. And if Jesus doesn't know who he is, he can't sit there in, in, in the silence that he sits in. So much so that it amazes Pilate, that it actually puts Pilate in a place of marveling at Jesus. Uh, Jesus is sure of who he is. He has no doubts about who he is. He tells quite plainly who he is. He is God everlasting, come to tabernacle amongst us, come to be the, the Messiah, the anointed one, that will bear sins away. He knows who he is, which is why he can stand in silence. So many times you and I run to our defense before we ever listen. We want to we want to defend immediately somebody when somebody says something contrary to how we picture ourselves. And the fact that Jesus is absolutely silent before Pilate, with the exception of one statement here at the text we're looking at, <clears throat> is amazing. It's because he's not looking for Pilate for affirmation of anything. He's quite sure of who he is. He's, he's not stuttering about through life, waiting for somebody to say, well, this is what you could be, or that's what you are. Uh, he knows who he is. I find strength in that. I, I hope you will as well. So let's, let's read this statement of Christology together and shore up for our minds who the Bible says Christ is. Not the men of the world. They simply don't know. They, they, they fumble all over themselves trying to formulate and reformulate Christ. And what they ought to do is go to the scriptures and figure out through the new birth who he is. So read with me. We confess the mystery and wonder of God made flesh. Rejoice in our great salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. With the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son created all things, sustains all things, and makes all things new. Truly God, he became truly man. Two natures in one person. He was born of the Virgin Mary and lived among us. Crucified, dead, and buried, he rose on the third day, ascended to heaven, and will come again in glory and judgment. For us he kept the law, atoned for sin, and satisfied God's wrath. He took our filthy rags and gave us his righteous robe. He is our prophet, priest, and king, building his church, interceding for us, and reigning over all things. Jesus Christ is Lord. We praise his holy name forever. Amen. And thank you for reading that with me. Now please go to the word of God, whether that's electronic or whether that's paper is up to you. But let's hear what the, what the word says. Now you should understand these are words, just like in any other book. The difference between this book and any other book is other books are written simply by men. Today people attack the Bible and say it's just a book written by men. And in that, they're partly right, written by men, under the superintendence of the Holy Spirit, so as to write exactly every jot and tittle according to the testimony of Jesus. So if Jesus is a liar, then this is only a book written by men. But if Jesus is God incarnate and cannot lie and does not lie and always speaks the truth, then this is not only a book written by men, but a book written by men as God so moved them to write down for you every, every jot and tittle. Not in English, you're reading a translation. There are some who say, well, we gotta have this translation or that translation. As long as they're faithful translations because the, the scriptures were not written in English, it wasn't even created yet. It was written in Greek, the New Testament, Hebrew for the Old Testament. A couple spots of Aramaic, but very little. But let's look now at Matthew 27. And receive this for what it is. This is God speaking to you through his word today. Now Jesus stood before the governor. And the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? 
Jesus said, you have said so. But when he was accused by the chief, chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave, he gave him no answer, not even a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed, or your translation may say marveled. They are both correct. Please bow your head with me. Father, I aid your servants this morning. For Christ is so different from us. He's never swayed by the opinions of men. He's not moved to do things out of weakness. But instead, he stands silent somehow. Not in weakness, but in strength, standing before creatures maintained by his own divine nature and yet will not answer them. Help us, Lord, to look past simply the words and to gaze and to marvel at who is our Savior, this man who is unique, this man who is God, this man who must be the bearer of our sins that we might not have them still. We ask, Lord, your blessing upon your servants now. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. I like the wording of Matthew. You'll see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have us go in a minute to Matthew 16, which I, I find a particular text that's useful to us here. Uh, Matthew 16, verse 13 through 20 is where we're going to go in just a bit. But look at verse 11 where it says, Now Jesus stood before the governor. And the idea here is he's standing before the governor because someone is, is presumably standing in judgment over him. You understand that the culture today does that now. They look at Jesus and say, well, here's who Jesus is. And then they formulate some answer that has nothing to do with who Jesus was. And you ask, well, how did you arrive there? That's actually a good question to ask people. I'm fond of asking that. Now, how did you get to the place where Jesus is just a teacher? Jesus is just a nice guy. Jesus doesn't exist. There's more proof for Jesus' existence than there is for yours, by the way. You don't doubt your existence, do you? You may sometimes, you may look around and you, know, you may be one of those people who follows some of these crazy philosophers who, who uh, say that we actually quote it wrong. I think, therefore I am. It's actually a question, therefore I am, is, is what that, that particular philosopher thought. And he thought that being pessimistic about everything actually proved his, the reality. No, I think you could be a pessimistic dream for all, that, for all that does. But Jesus stands before this governor, and this governor assumes that he sits in authority over Jesus. And yet Jesus, if he is what the Bible records, and if the, if the Bible is God's word, and it is, and if the Bible can't lie and it won't, then Jesus is standing before a creature who he sustains by the word of his power. And, and this creature, in, in, in a silly way that we as men, when, and ladies, when I mean men, I don't mean just those of us that are male. I mean all of us, the way that we'll puff ourselves up. Uh, we look like this tiny little thing who's been confronted by something else, so we swell up and try to be bigger than we are, that we might somehow fend off those things that frighten us. I've encountered this my whole life, people that swell up all the time trying to be bigger than they are, and I'm like, why do you do that? Well, what, what, and it comes down to people are small because they don't know who they are. Jesus is not, he's not bumbling about through the universe, through the cosmos, trying to figure out who and what he is. In fact, let's, let's go to Matthew 16 because he asks a question that is pivotal to, that, to all mankind because in the end, Jesus does not do what so many give them, um, so many think that he's done, give them room to come to a conclusion. And then whatever conclusion they come to is the, the one that, that it'll be just fine to have that. He asked a question here. Who do men say that I am? Understand that that's the pivotal question. What you do with Jesus is, is, the, is the main question about, about not only what affects your life now and in eternity. We just read about that in our catechism question. But it's going to flavor everything about you if you answer it rightly. And also if you answer wrongly. Let's look now at Matthew 16, verse 13. 
Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, understand, it's named after the king, the Caesar. It's named after Caesar. He came to the district of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, are you entertained by this bit? When you see this, the strange things that people say. When you ask people who Jesus is, well, for me, by the way, I, I, I'm, I'm not a great fan of well for me because it's such a weak, watered-down answer. For the believer, that's a terrible way to start the question because you've started off the same way the world does. Well, for me, as if somehow you and I define things, we don't. Things are defined by something greater than ourselves. We're defined by God himself. So be careful how you do it. The, the world says, well, for me... Uh, we ought not do that. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist. Now remember, he's dead by now. So they're thinking, well, we, there's some kind of, this one that raises the dead, makes blind eyes see, takes broken, withered hands, and has them made whole. It, 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 this miracle worker, maybe it's John resurrected. God's resurrected people before, People think a lot of times that we Christians believe that Jesus is the first resurrection. No, he's given the first resurrection, the, the order of, of preference. Though he's not the first one to be raised from the dead by God, he's the one whose resurrection is from there to everlasting because those other ones, like John 11, he dies again. And then he enters into eternity. Jesus dies once, raised forever. So some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, so they think one of the prophets has come back to them again. Jesus seeing those questions, seeing those answers, seeing those postulated things, then says, he, he dials in the question. He asks a, more gen, a bit of a general question, then, then he dials it in. But who do you say that I am? That's the question we've got to answer. Who do you say Jesus is? See, because the, the way that a believer should say this, and, and I'm just trying to coach you in a way here, because we have to be careful that we don't answer as the world answers. Well, for me, he's my savior. To which they can say, well, Buddha's mine. Muhammad's mine. Uh, Krishna or some other, some, some other false prophet. They can name all those. And say so they can say, well, for me. So just for for the, for the integrity of your answer, and and for an answer that actually has the potential to do to greater good, be careful how you couch it. Well, the Word of God says that Jesus is, and then you fill in the blank appropriately, according. You know, that's, that's where if you want one of those Christological statements that I have that we read from each Sunday, if you want one of those to carry around, put in your Bible. I'm glad to, to hand you those. I have them ready all the time. So that we can defend ourselves, have an answer for the hope that resides within us, of course. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is a massive statement. That's not just a few words. It is just a few words, but it's, the contents of those words are so gloriously pregnant that, that it, it, it's, it's everything. If people ask you who Jesus is, really, quoting this, is a, you really can't do much better than this. He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. You, you've theologically done all the heavy lifting right there in that little bitty phrase. You are the anointed one, the one that's promised to us, the one that, 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 that the Word of God says would be the one who would come, the, 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 the one who is God tabernacling amongst us, the anointed one, Christ and go, comes from the word Messiah. Messiah just means anointed one. The anointed one, particular article in front. Because there are other people that have been anointed. Baptists are afraid of that today because certain movements have taken that word anointed and they've, they've destroyed it. They, they talk about the anointing here and the anointing there and the people they're talking about are anointed, but they're not anointed with anything good. They're not anointed with the Holy Spirit. They're anointed with some, some really sadness and some madness. But you and I shouldn't push away from biblical words. Jesus is the anointed one. 
anointed by God to be the savior of mankind and called by God. He is God incarnate. He is all those things that the, the Bible speaks of him as being. So when he says it in that way, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, when he puts it that way, what he, he's, he's confessing, this confession that Peter makes is, is the basis of Christian faith, that Jesus is the Christ, that he is God incarnate, that, that he is God tabernacling amongst us. He is God walking in our presence. He is the equal to God. What's funny is Simon Peter, his name actually at this point is really just Simon. He's called Simon Peter because the writer knows it at that time. That's what he's going to be called. And it's funny, biblical characters sometimes have more than one name. Sometimes it's Simon, sometimes it's Peter, sometimes it's Simon Peter, sometimes it's Cephas. We do that, don't we? Most of you call me Rick. You understand that's not actually my name anywhere. Officially, on any document that matters, it's not my name. My name is Eric, spelled E-R-I-C-H. And if you, if you pronounce it in German, it's Erich. The last time I heard that was my, my old pa speaking to my father, whose name was Erich, and he would call him that. So that's been a long time ago. He died in the 70s. Last time I heard somebody say it that way. But the name that we give to Christ, and you, can, you don't have to call him Savior necessarily. He has to be your Savior. You may call him by something else. He may, you might say, he's my Lord. He's my Master. He is, in fact, all those things. By the way, you, you, you can't bifurcate. You can't separate his salvation and his lordship. If he is your savior, he is also your lord. That, that's a, a horrible pagan move for people to try to divide that in that way. When Christ saves you, he brings you into himself. And he becomes your head. He, he's, he's in, in fact, your everything. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Listen to what Jesus says. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. By the way, Simon Bar-Jonah, that just means Simon, son of Jonah. That's all it means, right? So when he says, Blessed are you, now I'm going to skip over the name. Blessed are you, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Let's pause there a minute. You didn't arrive at this by some means of your own thought process. Your friends didn't get together and, and conjure this up. This arrives to you from somewhere else. Where did it come from? Well, I'm glad you asked. But my Father who is in heaven. This is a revelation from God to Simon Peter. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. That phrase should sound familiar to you. That's God speaking from heaven at the baptism of the Lord Jesus. At, his, at the Mount of Transfiguration, God testifies from heaven audibly this is my son listen to him blessed are you Simon of Arjona for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my father who is in heaven and I tell you you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it be very plain in your understanding of this some would take this and make Peter a pope Peter would roll over in his grave if he knew such a word existed. He didn't, and he doesn't, and, he, and even now he, he probably rolls his eyes at the thought of popishness. What Peter is, is, when he's given this name that means rock, you understand it's not very descriptive of Peter at that moment. The reason I've gone to Matthew 16 is Jesus knowing who he is and then naming Simon Peter, he's just Simon the fisherman. He's a big dude. He, he's a big guy who happens to, he happens to be the oldest and, and oftentimes would be the speaker for the apostles. I think he's likely the oldest. He, he's a big guy and he tends to speak his voice. But he's no pope because there are no popes. There have been no popes in the church of Christ ever. But that's a side issue and it's, that, that, that's something we can talk about another time. It, it's of no significance. What's important here is Jesus is in no doubt of who he is. And the minute Peter is able to testify who he is, he becomes Peter who is the rock. When before he was Simon the fisherman. Be careful how you think about this because shortly here afterwards, just in the same chapter, we see Peter speaking up 
And Jesus answered him for, for what he, he does. He says, get behind me, Satan. So the rock can sometimes be also used in the wrong way. So what I want you to see in Matthew 16 as we travel back now in our Bibles to, to Matthew 27 Jesus has no doubts about his person. And, and Peter, in his confession that Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, becomes the rock. If you want to be a rock in the life of, uh, uh, of your family, in your life, in the lives of your friends, you must know who Christ is. And when you waver, when you are blown about by every wind of doctrine, you are not a rock. You're a squishy thing that seeps down into the cracks of life, has no substance. Now, you and I are all creatures, and that's all we'll ever be. But that creature that knows Christ, knows him to be who he says he is, knows Christ to be no liar, but truth incarnate. I am forever trying when I read Matthew 27 to run desperately to a phrase that's that's Pilate speaking to Jesus. What is truth? Because the world looks at you and it asks that question. You're a Christian, what's truth? And then you tell them, they go, well, that's your truth. I have my truth. Yes, but your truth is a lie. And when your truth is a lie, it's like saying the darkness is light. And up is down. It's nonsense. So it, it's an amazing thing to me to see this man who is the most powerful man ever on creation because he's also God who stands before his accusers, stands before a, a governor of the area, who actually was one of the longer serving governors of the area, and yet he was not well thought of. And he stands before his accusers, and he's silent. That just doesn't work for me, because when people start saying terrible things about me, I want to immediately say, that's a lie, that's wrong, it's all bogus. Everything that's come out of your mouth is venom and spewed ass. It's, it's nothing. It's, it's, it's garbage. He doesn't do that. Why? He's not interested in his defense. He knows who he is. He knows that the only answer he does give is the question that, that Pilate asked him. Are you the king of the Jews? Which, of course, he is. If Jesus says no, he's a liar. If Jesus says no, he rejects the mission that his father gives him. If he says yes, well, now they're going to kill him because now he's put himself up over against the, the Caesar as being king, but this is not his kingdom. This, this little kingdom that they're squabbling over, his kingdom is, is the everlasting kingdom. And he's quite plain about it. I can call all of heaven to come down and defend me. And you all would be gone in a, bl in a blink of an eye, a twinkling of an eye. You're done. You're, you're, you're smoked. Your vapor, you're gone. Because he can, because he knows who he is, he stands before his accusers. I, this is not only a wonderful text for the person of Christ, it's a wonderful text for you and for me. Because this culture, who at least once previously in, 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 in this country, had a certain kindness it bestowed to Christianity, has now peeled that back. And there's none of it left. Brothers and sisters, if you don't prepare your children to walk faithfully before Christ, this world is going to use them up. If you don't carefully raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will ill-prepare them to, for a testimony in Christ and to live successfully. And when I say successfully, I don't define that according to the terms of dead men. I define that according to the man who is the one who gives life. And if you want to live a life that matters, you'll live it before Christ and in his, in his presence, and for his glory. And if you live it any other way, well, you've wasted it. Jesus stands there silent. Save this one answer. You have said so. And it's true. It, it's altogether true. He's the king. And, and look at the response here. Then Pilate said, do you hear how many things they testify against you? Do you know what the world says about you? Oh, look at her. She believes in Jesus. Isn't that sweet? Poor thing. She doesn't know. We're just an evolved mistake. Jumped out of a mud puddle and went to work one day. What a ridiculous, illogical, unsound thought process that is. 
that nothing exploded and everything came from there. How many times have you been sitting around driving in your car and, and seen nothing explode? It's not in the habit of doing that. Usually nothing continues to be nothing. And if ever there was nothing, guess what there would be now? More nothing. By nothing, I, we don't mean a little something. There was, in fact, nothing except for the person of God himself. And God called all things into existence. They are created by him, for him, and for his glory. So when you see this Jesus, be careful how you see him. Because in my mind, I've got this ridiculous picture because... Sometimes, sometimes I have the mind of an old man and other times I have the mind of a child. And this is one where I have a picture in my head. He's the lamb. Who's the lion? And it's almost like it's phases of one and the other at the same time because he, he is always the lion. He's the lion of Judah. But right now, the work of the lamb must come forth. And the, and the lion bows its head in the presence of, its, of what could be prey if he were that kind of lion. He's not afraid of anyone. He doesn't have his life taken from him. He says, I have power to lay it down. He's unique in that. And in his power, he displays it through meekness. That's, that's, a, that's a word you and I need to lay hold of. It's not weakness. Just because they rhyme don't make them mean the same thing. Meekness is strength that's under control. There is no greater picture of meekness than Jesus sustaining his accusers and remaining silent as they accuse him of all forms of evil. Let me read to you from Matthew, from, Matthew, from Isaiah 53, 7. This is Matthew. Or Matthew I'm stuck on Matthew this morning. This is Isaiah 700 years prior to the coming of Christ writing. It really starts at the end of Isaiah 52, but I want to just look at one verse. This is a state of Christ, not just before Pilate, but every day of his life. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Why do you and I have so much trouble when somebody says something to us? You're a Christian? Tell me why you hate these people. Tell me why you hate those people. Well, I don't hate any of them. In fact, I'm, I'm strictly forbidden from doing it. And if I do it, I fail. Now, the Bible says this thing is good and that thing's bad. And you may have a difference of opinion. That only makes you wrong. God, who is light and truth, can never lie. And his opinions can't be thwarted by that, those of men. So when you walk into a culture who wants you to bow your head and, and, and profess to them that what they believe that is contrary to everything God believes is true. I, I've got a friend of mine, and yes, I, I mean a friend of mine, who for 30 years I have prayed for desperately. He's caught in a lifestyle that's going to kill him one day. It's going to cost him his life and his eternal soul. And he knows the only reason there's a relationship between he and I is I, I pray for him to come to saving faith one day. He wants desperately for me to say what I can't. And for 30 years, I told him I can't affirm that. I really wish I could. But I can't. Because it would make of me an unfaithful witness, a liar. I can't affirm a lie. I'm not able to do that. So many of us are confused by that. Well, I, I, I like this person. I, they're nice people. It's true. It doesn't mean that God is a liar. You, you can have somebody who's living their life in a way they shouldn't be. And to hate them is to misunderstand the scriptures. To hate them is outside the realm of possibility. So when they accuse us of hate, you ought to look as, as your dog does when you ask them sometimes an astrophysics question. What? What do you mean hate? 
If I did so, I would be under judgment of my Savior, not, not in a way that causes me to lose my salvation, but he would say, why are you such an unfaithful servant? Who told you to hate those people? What you're to do is to hate the, hate the, the lie. You're to hate evil. To, when, you, when you affirm evil, you're becoming party to it. So you can't affirm evil, you, and you must affirm good and truth, and you must do it lovingly to a world that holds you in judgment the way it does your Savior. Looks at you and says, oh, we've evolved past you. I love the way they use that word evolved. It used to be I was afraid of that word if you go way back. I just didn't use it because I thought, well, that's their word. No, 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 it's, it's our word. Because by the, by the new birth, I have become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Not by anything that I've done, but the thing that God has done, the thing that we read in Philippians, that work that he will bring to a proper and good conclusion. And when they use that word evolve, what they want to do is they want to dismiss you. They want to be dismissive of you, of your opinions, of the way you think and of the way you live. It's a way of putting you over in the party of idiots. Well, that, that, that poor man, he really believes that whole Bible. Yes, he does. And he's willing to bet his life on it. You had, you had better be in the same place, by the way. Christ calls us to a faithfulness in a world. You, you should understand your life lived this way. I, I was born in a little town in, in Kentucky, in Jefferson Town. Who, now it's been swallowed up by Louisville, largely. There's still elements of it that are still a little, little place, a little J-town. But in the end, that's not my home. I'm in a foreign place. And I was born there waiting to go to the place that is my home, that, that, that is in the presence of Christ directly. In other words, God has taken you, he has birthed you from above, and then he has put you in right dead center of enemy territory and said, thrive. Do well for my name's sake. Live gloriously. Now, how you define that, be careful. Because if you define it by the terms of dead men, oh, you'll look at it and go, oh, I'm losing. But if you define it by the terms of the everlasting, the ever-living man, living faithful for Christ is everything. Anything less than that is this. That's what children do. The words of Paul come to mind. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, thought as a child, but now as a man. See, some of us need to grow up into Christ, need to grow up and realize that, that being a Christian is not something to be ashamed of, but instead to glory in. Jesus had no doubt about himself. My question to you this morning as I look at a Savior who tolerates his creatures accusing him of every form of evil and in silence does it and again I, I'm altogether amazed I, I am in the position of, that Pilate's in he, I'm amazed I'm, I marvel how can you be quiet while they say such terrible things about you well because there's something more important going on do you know your life is more important than what people say about you you we have got to get used to the idea that people are going to say things about you that aren't true. They said it about your master. What makes you think they won't say it about you? They accuse the master of being a fraud. If they accuse you of being a fraud, understand you're in good company. They accused every one of the apostles of being a fraud. Every one of them died, with the exception of John. Every one of them died, put to death by the world because the world was not worthy of them. So my question to you is, knowing who Christ is, do you know who you are? Because that's what matters. The way that you can live here most effectively, most gloriously, is to know that I am a follower of Christ. Everything else about me after that is altogether insignificant. I mean, it matters in the sense that if you're born a man or born a woman, that's the way God intended you to be. Live, live to God's glory in that way. 
But those things are subordinate to, I'm a follower of Christ. I follow him in my thinking, in my living, in my doing. All that I am is affected by that. Look at the testimony of, of the word of God concerning Pilate. Verse 14. But he gave him no answer. Sometimes the best answer you can give those who are dead is to say nothing. Especially when they're trying to just prod you into a bad answer. Sometimes the best answer. I've had, had people try to prod me and I, 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 know, I, I don't, it's not a controlled thing, but there's a corner of my mouth that turns up unconsciously. And my wife always, there it is, there it is. You're doing it again. Because I know who the truth is. You can't defeat that argument. You lose the minute you oppose that. You can't win that. And I know that, and I'm affected by that. And, 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 and when, the, when the accuser or one sent by him comes to me and says, you Christians, I, I know who I am. Because I know who he is. Look, look at what happens. But he gave him no answer, not even a single charge, to a single charge. So the governor was greatly amazed. Maybe in your translation it says marvel. It's best to leave that to them. Let the world marvel. How does he do that? How does she do that? How, how do they live that way? Because I've decided this is worth doing. And that's not. Anybody could do that. Everybody's doing that. And it doesn't matter. Only the one called out of death and into life by Christ can do the high calling that is the Christian life. Amen. It's impossible. I've said that Christ through his Holy Spirit should do it in you and through you. It's better to leave them amazed. You don't have to answer their every question. Just let that smile. The one that my wife says is underneath, hidden. And it's because I know who the truth is. His name is Jesus. I don't fear the world. Because the one who made it has made me to be his own. I'm affected by that more than all the accusations that the knotheads make at me. Oh, he's this and he's that. And there are times I want to, you look and you say, but there are better things to do. Jesus said better things to do. So do you. Don't you worry about their accusations. You worry about who Christ is. If you know who Christ is, that's all you need to know. By the way, you don't have to be a, uh, have a full orb theological debate and everything. Because it all comes down to who do you say that Christ is? That is your worldview right there. But with that, I'm going to ask that you would bow your head with me. Father, help us. The example of our Savior, a man, altogether a man but also God, stands before his creatures, the ones he holds and permits, and not only permits, but causes to breathe and to live. In him they move, live, and breathe, and, and, and have their being. And yet, they accuse him of evil. We are told by the New Testament, if they treated the master in this way, so also will they treat the servants. Help us, Lord. For we seem to have entered into a phase where our Christianity, which once was permitted, is now no longer safe as it once was. May we stand all the more. And as the tide turns against us, help us that we might develop legs to stand. And we stand not upon our own testimony, but the testimony that Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God, and his name is Jesus. We ask, Lord, your blessing upon us as your people. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Carl, could you dismiss us, please, brother?